Uh, we are the College of Complexes. We've been around uh, at least uh, since 1951. Uh, and besides that, tonight we have uh, two uh, young ladies, uh, Dana and Melissa. It's, uh, uh, <coughs> Melissa Bryce and uh, Dana Kierkegaard uh, on uh, the uh, City Council on uh, Investments in, uh, in uh, Fossil Fuel uh, fossil fuel Companies. So uh, asking them to divest. Presenters tonight, please be kind to them. Uh, they are all right. I'm Melissa Bryce. Thank you for welcoming us. Um, and this is Dana. Um, so we are with Chicago 350. So 350.org, for those of you who haven't heard of it, is a national grassroots, actually a global grassroots movement to solve the climate crisis. They operate in every country except for North Korea. And there's a national organization of paid organizers. There's a board of director. It was started by Bill McKibben, an author, environmentalist, and a professor at Middlebury College in Vermont. And so he and some students started this organization in 2007. And it is called 350 because that represents the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that meets a safe level. James Hansen is a former NASA climate scientist, and he published many articles on climate change. And he has determined that 350 parts per million represents um, a climate to which civilization has adapted. Um, back from a million years ago, we can see how much carbon was in the atmosphere, and it never reached over 296. And we are currently at 401, I believe. Um, so we need to reverse that back down to 350. And also 350, because it's a number, that's a global language. So any place that starts their own chapter organically in the world can adopt that name, and it's easy to understand. So our Chicago chapter began in 2013, and um, we are all volunteers. So while 350 National Organization is nonprofit, the Chicago group is not. Um, we are just affiliated with them. Um, we have them as resources. We have bi-weekly meetings um, with the U.S. campaign coordinator. So they are involved in our campaign and they do help us, um, but we are all volunteers, so we're not paid staff. This is just an addition to our, our work lives. Um, so that's probably why we haven't progressed as far as we want. Um, so I think that's it on 350. Oh, so no, a little bit more. So um, 350.org has multiple campaigns that they're working on. They are trying to fight the tar sands. So you've probably heard about the Keystone XL fight that 350 has supported greatly. Um, so there's the tar sands movement, there's divestment, which is the fastest growing divestment movement in history. And so that is what Chicago 350 has decided to focus on. And they also, um, did part of global power shift was, was trying to get power into the hands of youth. Um, so that was another thing that they were engaged in. Um, but we will talk in detail about what Chicago is doing on divestment. Um, but I will turn it, oh, and someone was asking about our symbols, so I will explain our logo to you. So we wanted to model the Chicago flag because that's very iconic in Chicago. And so the four stars that we replaced with our logos, um, the first one is supposed to be blowing wind. The second one is a windmill, uh, and then the sun, and then a solar panel, just to show that we want to reinvest in renewable energy. That, that's the public explanation. What's the real? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> OK, I will turn it over to Dana, who will kick off our presentation. So as, so as Melissa said, we are Chicago 350. And we're just going to explain to you a little bit about our divestment movement and that the divestment movement as a whole. So um, basically our presentation is going to go through a few things. We're going to do, um, we're going to talk about how divestment is growing, how the movement is growing, um, why you should divest, what it is, and how you should reinvest. 
and how why divestment is a moral issue, a political issue, a financial issue, um, and then a little bit more in detail about Chicago in our divestment program. So the movement as a whole for divesting from fossil fuels started about three years ago, and it has about 400 student campaigns, 25 schools that are committed to divesting, but it also goes further than that. It's joined by faith institutions, foundations, um, and I think, I think this numbers, this 200 institutions committed is a little old. I think it's more than 300s now. Um, but there is actually a National Divestment Day in February each year, and that takes place in 60 countries on six continents, and we actually had one here in Chicago, and that happens every year in February. So this graph kind of represents what institutions are divesting the fastest. So you can see from this that the foundations are divesting like the most first, and then we have the government organizations and faith based groups. Uh, uh, Close to my friend. Yeah. Sorry, guys. No, no, don't worry um, about yes, it. So, yeah, this graph just represents what institutions are divesting at the quickest rate, and this number looks like the more up to date number, and we have 349 here. So, the way that we define fossil fuel company is just a company that has holds in fossil fuel reserves. And there's actually a really good resource at this link here that you can check out and it just talks about the, the biggest 200 companies and those are the ones that um, we're looking to divest from. So this just goes in a little more detail. We're calling for a commitment to remove investments with, from these companies within five years. So like we said, um, fossil fuel company is defined as those companies holding fossil fuel reserves. And this list talks about the top 100 oil and gas companies and then the top 100 coal companies. So we're working, we're trying to work with the city of Chicago to invest from the companies on this list. And then one of the biggest parts of our movement is not just divesting from fossil fuels, but it's also using that money to reinvest in renewable energy infrastructure, community development, transportation, and just sustainable development as a whole. So the divestment and reinvestment campaign is more about aligning our values with our investment decisions. So we know that it's not a good idea to be investing in fossil fuels. We know what it's doing to our planet. So now we're just about aligning those, those two things. Um, so why we must divest? We are all part of this transition and we need to make a just transition from the dangerous, harmful fossil fuel energy economy that we all live in, that we all see every day and we need to change it, and we need to divest, and we need to reinvest in infrastructure that will help move our future generations forward. So, Melissa is going to talk a little bit more about the moral, political, and financial reasons for divestment. that really launched the divestment movement. A particular financial analyst group in England put out a report that um, Bill McKibben talks about often, if you've heard of him on his Do the Math tour. Um, these are the three numbers he says you really need to remember, um, that we need to keep global warming below two degrees Celsius. We are already at one degree. Um, the amount of carbon that we can emit into the atmosphere and remain below 2 degrees Celsius is 565 gigatons. And the amount that fossil fuel companies have in their reserves and plan to burn, it's already in their business model to burn these, is five times the amount that we can emit to be over 2 degrees Celsius. So they have about 2,795, I believe, is the number of gigatons in their reserves. So that report really spurred the investment movement because it became clear that 80% of those reserves need to stay below ground. And I don't know if any of you follow The Guardian, but they are doing a great campaign on climate change right now, sending out a lot of articles and information, and they have a campaign called Keep It in the Ground, and they are targeting the Wellcome Trust and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to encourage them to divest. Dana had mentioned that different organizations and foundations are divesting, and I don't know if you had heard, but the Rockefeller Foundation uh, divested, and that was a huge symbolic push for the divestment movement since they're the you know leaders in oil <laughs> in the past. Um, 
And also another, I just wanted to elaborate too on what Dana mentioned about the governments that are divesting, and those refer to city governments. So there are um, over 40 cities that have committed to divestment. San Francisco, Seattle, Boulder, Madison is the, the closest to us, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, there's a long list. If you're interested, you can go to gofossilfree.org and see all of the institutions and cities that have committed to divestment. And we want Chicago on that list. So that's why we are targeting this. Um, so I will go into, first of all, the financial argument for divesting. There are a number of reasons. Um, I'll name them and then I'll go into them in more detail. So there is the stranded assets argument, um, which will lead to a carbon bubble. I'll talk about that. There is the high investment, low return argument that fossil fuel companies are doing to extract fossil fuels. Um, there's also the poor returns on fossil fuel investments. And um, I'll go into detail about some comparisons between the S&P 500, where they, they catch fossil fuels in and saw what it, the market did, and then where they removed fossil fuels and saw um, the comparison to see if you would lose any money. Um, and then lastly, the impending regulations, which will drive up the cost of fossil fuels. So those are the major arguments for why it's not financially sound to divest, and it's actually less risky to remove your money than it is to keep it in. Um, so to begin with, the stranded assets. Um, just to ground everyone, um, a stranded asset is one whose price is vulnerable to the sudden decline when markets belatedly recognize the truth about their underlying value. So it's similar to what to happen in the subprime mortgage crisis. Um, so it is valued um, that if we were to, because we have to keep 80% of that in the ground, and all of those are already above ground in the, the value of the stock prices, um, if people were, to, you know, if the price of carbon you know, was to change and it became risky to keep your money in there and everyone just automatically tried to sell off all their stocks, it would be a $22 trillion carbon bubble. That's a huge value. That's like 10 times the amount of the housing bubble. So that's a pretty scary number. Um, so it's um, best to get your money out of there before everyone's trying to sell at the same time. Um, so for the riskiness, um, sorry, let me put my place. So the fossil fuel industry is gambling trillions of dollars on new investments in high capital, low return projects, um, which depend on high oil prices. Um, I just heard on NPR the other day that like the Russian economy, for example, needed oil to stay at above $100 a barrel. And right now it's, I think I heard um, like 42. Six, 42, yeah. So um, it's much lower. So it's not financially viable with all these more expensive extraction processes. Um, you know, drilling, deep ocean drilling, tar sands, those are all more expensive to extract. Um, so they're spending a lot of money on these processes and they need oil to stay high and right now it's too low. So the fossil fuel industry's bullish projections of high prices and increased demand are not materializing um, due to a combination of economic factors including the rapid decrease um, of alternative energy costs, increasing costs of fossil fuel extraction, increases in energy efficiency, changing social norms, and increased environmental regulation. Um, so the fossil fuel industry's rosy demand projections are also counter to a growing number of investment analysts and reports that indicate deteriorating fundamentals for, um, for the industry. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, comparisons. So MSCI, um, Apiro Group, and the sign like there's another one that starts with an I. Um, I can find it. So those um, financial analysts, um, sorry, impacts investments. Um, so they have done a lot of research into seeing what the um, market would look like if you were to take your money out of fossil fuel industries. So um, MSCI, which runs global indices used by more than 6,000 pension and hedge funds, found that investors who divested from fossil fuel companies would have um, earned an average of 13% a year since 2010, compared to the 11.8% under conventional investors. 
Um, similarly, uh, portfolio of shares in fossil fuel companies included has grown in a value of 62.2% since 2010, but this compares to the 69.9% growth of a fund without fossil fuel investments. Um, so those are just two examples of it's, you're not going to lose money if you divest from fossil fuels. That is one of the major rebuttals um, when you're talking to people about trying to get them to divest. They say that it's too risky to not have oil and gas and coal in your um, portfolio, but actually there are many studies that show, and these are over like 20 year periods, um, that show that it's not risky. And actually coal has been on the decline for 10 years. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Mayor's Innovation Project. Has anyone heard of that? So there's a group of mayors who feel like the federal government is and state governments are not acting quickly enough on major issues. And so all of these mayors have formed a coalition and they're trying to get things done. And so they are all for divestment. And actually, um, I just watched an hour-long presentation that they had where the former mayor of Seattle spoke and um, the former comp deputy comptroller for New York State also spoke and said that um, to really have your money in coal is extremely risky and it's not a financial, a good financial investment. Um, so I encourage you guys to check out the Mayor's Innovation Project too. Is Rob on that list? I don't know if he's on that list. You know, <laughs> probably not, right? <laughs> Um, another popular rebuttal that you're hear, you'll hear from people who you're trying to get to divest, so like our, our city might say, shareholder engagement is really the way to go. I don't want to sell all of my stock because I want to have a seat at the table for when they're making decisions about what they're going to do with their money when they invest in the company. Um, but that argument doesn't really work when it comes to fossil fuel industries because they're we are asking them to change their core business model. And so you can, it's like an analogy that 350 often says, it's like asking Nike to stop making shoes. Like that's not good for Nike. Um, so the fossil fuel industry, you know, if you're a, having a seat at the table, um, you can't really ask them to change their core business model. So for people to say that they want to keep shares to influence companies um, is not a very sound argument. And you should ask them, if you hear anyone asking you that, um, you should ask them, what are they going to ask the company to do? If you want your seat at the table, how are you going to use the stocks that you own to influence them? Um, and also, there's been a lot of research to see if companies like Shell and BP are investing in renewable energy, because a lot of people say, oh, they'll just become energy companies. But BP sold all of its solar that it was working on, and I think Shell invests the most in alternative energies other than fossil fuels, and it's only 2.6% of their finances. So it's very small. <laughs> so the shareholder engagement argument is pretty weak, in our opinion. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. Um, so that's a, a lot on the financial argument. To move on to the political argument, um, the federal government's inaction on climate change um, shows that they're not going to do anything. So we need to break the political silence on climate change. Um, and so one example, I have many examples of where the government has not acted on climate change. So the Kyoto Protocol, sorry. The Kyoto Protocol is an international treaty which extended the 1992 UN framework on climate change and that committed to all state parties to reduce greenhouse gas emissions based on the premises that global warming exists and that it's caused by man-made CO2 emissions. And so Clinton brought that to Congress and Congress did not ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Um, so That's you know, because Mark Kirk working for the competitive enterprises Okay. Excuse me for the rebuttal. Yeah. Um, and another example in 2014, the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions stated that 144 bills pertaining to climate change were introduced, and only three of those bills, which are only were only loosely associated climate change, were passed through Congress. So it's pretty safe to say that they're not going to act on climate change. Um, so the divestment movement puts a lot of political pressure on them to act, and it's modeled after the South Africa divestment movement, um, where people were divesting from South Africa, and um, I think Berkeley was one of the initial adopters of that, and after Nelson Mandela got out of prison, one of the first places he went before he even went to the White House,
Ramos was to Berkeley to thank them because he said that that divestment campaign really worked. Um, so we feel like divestment does have a strong voice in the political silence. Um, I just saw an article in The Guardian about the amount of money that GOP candidates are receiving from individuals and companies that have ties to the fossil fuel industry um, from oil and gas operations, fracking companies, drilling firms, and other activities associated with emissions of industrial carbon dioxide. Um, so the Guardian article has just mentioned that um, there has been $62 million just this year into super PACs from those companies towards the GOP candidates. And they had mentioned that Ted Cruz, uh, Rick Perry, and Jeb Bush get the most. And Rick Perry and Ted Cruz are some of the most vocal climate deniers in our government. So it's pretty apparent that if you're a climate denier, it's probably because you're getting paid by the fossil fuel industry to spew their, regular, their rhetoric. How about Hillary? Yeah, how about Hillary? Um, this article from The Guardian said that the Democratic candidates were not taking money from these corporations and individuals, according to The Guardian. Um, and one last thing I'll mention is that 2013 and 2014, the oil and gas industry paid $285 million in lobbying and $40 million to campaign contributions. So we're already up this year, and the year's not through um, compared to 2014. Is there a direct correlation between the amount of money they give and the uh, rise of global temperature? No, I haven't seen anything like that. <laughs> wait, wait until question period. Later. Um, so divestment is not about bankrupting the fossil fuel companies. Um, we are not going to bankrupt them, but we can hurt them financially. Stanford divested its billions of dollar endowment from coal. Um, so it is beginning to speak to the fossil fuel industry. And I saw Bill McKibben speak at Northwestern. Um, little caveat, Northwestern and University of Chicago and Loyola all have divestment campaigns. And so the Northwestern divestment campaign had Bill McKibben speak back in the winter. And he said that the divestment campaign was working well enough that the fossil fuel industry is starting to get nervous. So he showed us a video that the fossil fuel industry put out in response to divestment. Um, it was a lot of fear mongering and it was a cartoon about how much you need fossil fuels in your life to live the life that you want to lead and the life that you're comfortable with, um, which is just a false premise because there are other options. Um, you can get your energy from renewable sources. Um, but that, Bill McKinnon was pretty proud of that video because it showed that he's starting to make the fossil industry nervous and their, the investment campaign is having an impact. Um, and also, a major theme of the divestment movement is to stigmatize the fossil fuel industry, similar to how the tobacco industry was stigmatized. So all of these candidates on the Republican Party are taking money from fossil fuel industries, but we want that to be so socially unacceptable that they don't want to be associated with fossil fuel industry companies. Um, so that's another major tactic of the divestment movement. Um, and so lastly, we're making politicians choose a side. Are you going to take dirty money, or are you going to be on the right side of history? Um, lastly, the moral argument to divestment. Um, so fossil fuels are significantly altering our climate. And like Bill McKibben says, um, to switch to renewable energy and get off these fossil fuel industries is not a radical idea. The radical idea is to pump CO2 into the atmosphere and change the physical atmosphere and environment of our planet into something other than we've experienced for the last 10,000 years. That is the radical idea. Um, so we need to move away from that. And also, um, I read in a book called Active Hope that um, Africa only contributes 3% of carbon dioxide emissions, but they are going to suffer more greatly than the United States. So it's a human rights issue, it's an injustice issue, that others have to suffer for the pollution that we are causing, and we are not acting on to change, even though we know what's going on. And Bill McKibben often says, if it's wrong to wreck the planet, it's wrong to profit from that wreckage. You know, maybe, 30 years ago, we didn't understand what was happening, but now the evidence is clear, and we have the moral obligation to act, because we know that we are causing human suffering, so we need to change. 
Um, so that's the, the major oral <coughs> argument. So I will change it over to Dana, who will describe um, a little bit about the pension funds and what we are trying to accomplish here in Chicago. Um, so basically, we are, there's two different things that we're trying to do with the city of Chicago. We are trying to get the pension funds to divest their holdings from fossil fuels, and we're also trying to get the city of Chicago to adopt a divestment resolution and divest their operating budget. So the units that we're focusing on mostly, sorry, my computer died, so it's kind of a little far away. Um, the firemen's union, the policemen's union, the laborers, and the municipal union, all these unions have money that are currently invested in fossil fuels, and we need to work to convince them that this is not a good financial strategy and that their money would be better off in renewable energy. Thank you. <laughs> um, so basically the, the decision makers that we're trying to focus on for these is for the city of Chicago to adopt this resolution, we need to get the aldermen and the, alder um, the alder women and the city council on board and Mayor Rahm Emanuel eventually. <laughs> and then for the pension boards, we need to go after, or for the pension funds, we need to go after the pension boards and all of the union members um, to try to adopt the divestment strategy. And then basically what all of you can do, or your friends and family, um, you can sign a postcard to your alderman or alderwoman calling for divestment. You can go to ward nights and talk to them about divestment. Um, you can also come to our Chicago 350.org monthly meetings. We have meetings every month on the second Saturday, I believe the second Saturday of every month we meet in Lakeview. And our doors are open for, for new people, new ideas. Um, and then you can also come to our events in Days of Action. We're always planning events to try to get the word out. Like I said, we have divestment day. Um, we postcard a lot outside of L-stops. Um, we're kind of just trying to get the word out to as many people as possible so that um, when we go to the city council, they've already heard of us, they're aware, and they're ready to go. Um, you can also arrange for a speaker to talk to a group about divestment, a group that you're involved in. You can do that through us. Um, Chicago, or 350 National helps us in stuff like that all the time. So we. Like I said, we're, tr we're trying to get the word out as fast as possible. We're a newer group, and we're a lot of us are new to organizing, so any and all help from people who are familiar with the territory is much appreciated. And then you can join our campaign by becoming a member for our organization. We're all volunteers, and we know that every single person has a special skill set to offer us in a different way, and that's why we love having such a diverse group of people. So. We thank you so much for coming here and listening to us. We really appreciate it. You can visit our website. You can sign up for our listserv email, which just talks about our campaign. You can email us directly, or you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Okay. We'd love to have all of you. <laughs> all right. Stay up there. There's question periods coming up. Um, I'd like to get the first question, Brahm, if you don't mind. I'd like to know what your stance is on uh, nuclear power and, it, and its potential to help uh, get us off oil? Uh, just what your stance is on it? Well, uh, we, we know that, but I'm asking them a question, okay? Yeah, so we are going to call, kind of follow the national organization on this, and they haven't officially taken a stance on nuclear energy, so we just have our personal opinions, but as far as um, okay. the 350 organization, um, can't really speak to what they think about nuclear energy. Fair enough. I think Bill McKibben is critical of nuclear. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. <laughs> you said that the uh, natural background uh, was like 290 parts per million, and that we're settling, we, and that someone feels that 350 is a is a supportable, it's a livable threshold. Yeah. So you're envisioning burning fossil fuels in the future because it will be above the, nat the natural background. Well, not to continue burning fossil fuels, but we're already at 400, and I've read that even if you were to stop burning fossil fuels today, the parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere would still increase, just because of the slow release of um, like how carbon works in the atmosphere. I don't know all the science behind it, um, but it's going to take a while to reverse that trend, and I don't know even how the Earth would get it back in balance, but I know we're already above 350. <coughs> 
So yes. ideally, we don't want to burn anymore because it would just continue to increase. All right, Laura Chamberlain. Um, yeah, it's it's the sink in the ocean. The oceans have absorbed okay. so much carbon, carbon, and it's going to release uh, that. Okay. Once the level comes down, it will just keep releasing, keep releasing. So, um, how much money in the city's coffers are we talking? So we don't have, that's a great question. Um, we actually have the same question, right. we're not sure, but of the two pension funds we looked into, so the municipal fund um, is about $5.1 billion, and it has 35 different managers. And then um, there is a breakout of like all the annuities that that goes into, but we don't have it further broken out into like what all of those particular companies are. Um, so we, we've we asked the city, we probably pretty much have to do a FOIA request, and then basically we have to come back to the treasurer or the pension boards to direct those fund managers to look at how much money is in fossil fuels. That's not readily available information. They All the men are going to be able to help you get that information. Yes, we would love to have them help us get that information. They have the aldermen help you. Right. Yeah, because we actually did meet with the deputy city treasurer before he left office. So he was part of the administration before Kurt Summers Jr. came in, and we asked him if he knew, and he didn't know. So he yeah. said they would have to look into it. That's right. what I just said. Bob Rosenstein. I'll just preface my question by commenting that uh, I was at that meeting where uh, the kid in school uh, oh, had a yeah. chance to engage in discussion with him. Oh, great. Uh, my question really is one that has pained me a great deal about the subsidies our federal government yes. gives to the fossil fuel industry. And I want to know what strategy 350.org on the uh, national and the local level is doing. Also, what about this Enbridge issue with the pipelines across the Atlantic Strait? Bill McKinnon was there. And uh, I understand the end is is planning on increasing the flow rate through these decrepit pipes. Right. There's a good chance we'll have the greatest ecological disaster in American history. So what is 350.org doing nationally and locally now on both of those key issues? Yeah, so they are. 350 National Organization is working on tar sands. There are multiple groups in the region. So Madison and Minnesota are really leading the charge on Enbridge. Just got an email today actually about a paid organizer who sits in Minnesota. And their strategy right now is they are doing um, a public lawsuit against Enbridge. Um, they are not hiring lawyers. They're representing themselves. And they said that anyone can join on to that lawsuit and represent themselves. So they said that and I don't know all the politics of it, I just read it briefly today, um, but they said that there has been some success in fighting pipelines that way in the past, but it's not like very frequently used, this tactic. Um, so that's one thing they're doing, and they do have paid people solely focused on tar sands. Chicago, we're really small. There's only about six of us, and so we said we can only tackle one issue at a time. So we're focusing on divestment, but we would love for the group to grow because the national team and the region really wants Chicago working on tar sands, especially since one of the largest tar sands refineries is there in Whiting, Indiana. Um, we went and did a protest there with the Sierra Club um, and the, the residents of Southeast Indiana. Um, so, Southwest, Indiana. Northwest. 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 <laughs> Northwest. Northwest. Yeah. So, um, basically, there is a great need for Chicago to get involved. We just don't have the bandwidth. Um, and in terms of subsidies, that's a great question. I don't know if 350 stands on subsidies. Oh, I mean, obviously, they wouldn't want them, but I don't know if they're actively pushing to get those eliminated. Um, All right. Pat Butler? Yes. Uh, Obviously, none of this is going to happen unless we find a practical, usable, economically feasible substitute for fossil fuels. Realistically, how close are we to that right now tonight? I ask this because two years ago, I was at an auto show in Evanston where they were demonstrating the Tesla, which was a hybrid uh, I believe it was half electric and uh, half gasoline. No, 100% electric. Uh, how close are we to being able to say to the fossil fuel companies and to the countries which hold us hostage uh, for uh, dependent on their fossil fuels, how close are we to be able to say we've got something better? Thank you. Bye bye.
I don't know like the timeline to actually get there, but I know what we need to hit. So we need to be at 100% renewable energy by 2050 to stop catastrophic climate change. And so 350 is actually launching part of this divestment campaign to ask cities and funds to get to 100% renewable, ener renewable energy by 2030. Um, so that's what we need to do. And I actually don't know how close we are to doing that. I know Hawaii is on their way to 100% renewable by 2050. And um, you know we saw that just at the G7 summit, they said that they were gonna get to 100% renewable by 2050. So those numbers are out there. Um, the reality of hitting that, I really can't speak to. And, and the infrastructure is, is there. The fossil fuel companies are the ones who want to make you believe that you need to rely on their oil, their gas, their coal, and that these renewable forms of energy can't sustain the life that we live. But that's not necessarily the case. Like the infrastructure is there and available. We just need to be investing in it. Carl Schwett. Yeah. One of the slides you had during your uh, presentation, it mentioned faith-based organizations. What sort of things are, are they are faith-based organizations doing that are anti-climate, you know, let's say. So I can speak to that. I'm part of the United Methodist Church, and I'm also working on a investment campaign for United Methodist Church. And so each Methodist church has its own conference, and so I'm part of the Northern Illinois Conference. And they do have about $700 million invested in the fossil fuel industry for the United Methodist Global Pension Board. Um, so churches are investing in fossil fuel industries, and so we need them to stop, and there's so many moral issues <laughs> there. So our, and to give you an update, the Northern Illinois Conference of United Methodists did agree to divest. So, Yay! Yeah. Okay, uh, connected with that, a good organization is Faith in Place. Have yes. you heard of them? Are you working with them? Yes, we are familiar with Faith in Place. That's a great example. So they help churches to green their buildings. Um, there's a couple of churches in Oak Park. There's Euclid United Methodist Church. Um, I don't know if anyone knows Dick Alton, but he's active in the environmental community. And um, they have 25% of their energy from renewable. Um, they have geothermal and solar. Uh, Charles? Charles? Yeah, you, you made the assertion that these companies, the oil, gas, and coal, had all these reserves. And I'm not a capitalist, but companies don't overproduce normally. And I got the question how valid that is. I mean, why would they? continue to drill pump oil when they're not getting any money for the oil that they have. I have the answer. Well, if they're not getting the money, they won't drill it. But right now, they are getting the money. So the money's there, so they're drilling. And as long as the money is there, they're going to keep drilling. So that's why we kind of need to take the money out, and then there will be no, there will be no need for their oil or for their gas. What's happening with the oil prices is really complex, and it's uh, it's about international politics. And um, so they're uh, trying to crush Russia. Is definitely uh, Saudi Arabia and the U.S. and Qatar are trying to crush Russia, and also they're trying to drive out of business small fracking operators in the U.S. as well. So they want to consolidate and get all of these uh, oil reserves into the hands of the big guys, and they want to crush Russia. So they are, and there's a little bit of, uh, Saudi Arabia is hit, sitting on so much oil um, that is easily obtainable, that they're a little afraid that they're not going to get anything for it if, the, if countries move uh, ahead as fast as we want them. So it's a little bit like Saudi Arabia is out there going, we're going to sell our oil, which is really easy to get. They don't have to get $100 a barrel in Saudi Arabia. Um, it's really easy to drill. They, we're going to get as much money as we can for the oil that we got right now. We're going to drive the competitors out of uh, business and drive Russia. And they wanted to drive Iran out of the business as well, but the, the deal with Iran actually has brought them back into the whole oil mix. That's one of the reasons why there's senators against this deal, 
It's all about oil, you guys. So, so the, it's a complex situation. Yeah, it's really complex. <laughs> it's all about oil. Yeah. Yes. Um, and real. Oh, uh, we think. <laughs> the um, address the question about cheap energy because the nice thing about cheap energy is the bad thing about expensive energy is that only rich people can afford it and like maybe middle class people but there's a line a poverty line below which I mean what is what is the energy cost that some a family living below the poverty line could afford, and how was that? Yeah, there and are a number, so, of, yeah. number of answers to that. So one is that it's falsely cheap. It's cheap because the government subsidizes it. So if we were to put a tax on carbon, well, first we should get rid of subsidies, and second we put a tax on carbon that will drive up the price and will make renewable energy more competitive. Yeah. Um, and also, it's only cheap in terms of how much people are paying to use it, but there are all these externalities that are not factored into the cost of carbon pollution, such as public health issues, um, environmental issues that need to be, areas that need to be cleaned up. Um, so there are a lot of, and climate change, so climate change is so expensive. So in cleaning up um, after natural disasters, um, so there's all this money that's associated with carbon pollution and the use of fossil fuels that's not tied in directly to the energy use. And if it were, then it would be more of an even playing field. So it's kind of at a disadvantage. Can I follow up on the same subject? Well, for clarity, it's like, so what you're telling me is that uh, the current price of carbon-based energy is artificially low, yes. and that if we remove the, that artificial, it's going to raise the price of energy. But what I was asking is, how does raising the price, the raising the price of energy, affects the poor people disproportionately? Well, if we're willing to spend so much money on fossil fuel subsidies, why would the government spend money on renewable energy subsidies? So that would make it more bearable for people who can't afford it. That's what I would say to that. Wind is coming on board in Iowa for one cent a kilowatt hour. Uh, <laughs> one cent. Uh, we think you are. Yeah, I just wonder, uh, right now you are trying to persuade the uh, investor to de-invest in the fossil fuel and uh, industry. And uh, the result will be a low share price of those uh, companies. And uh, low share price means higher PE ratios. So some other investors may invest at the fossil fuel companies. They may, the chance uh, to earn more money is higher. Uh, I think this is just economic balance issue. Have you considered that? Um. I have read some things in 350 before that they say, you know, someone will buy it and we're not going to bankrupt them. Like, there will be people that will want to buy those stocks when they're sold off. Um, so that's when we really just have to redirect to the moral issue and that we're not doing this to bankrupt the fossil fuel industry. That really, from a moral perspective and from a political perspective, um, divestment should really be pushing for active legislation on climate change to get us to renewable energy. And I think it gets the word out too. So if you have these big organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation, the Guardian, you have them divesting from fossil fuels, then you have word out there and people are wondering why, why did they divest and what did they reinvest in? So then it gets the word out more, then you get the word out more about the moral argument too. You get, if people are reinvesting, then they're going to ask why did someone pull out? And then they have to think about the financial argument themselves before they go back in. Yeah, and also um, Bank of America divested from coal. So I think when huge banks are taking their money out of coal industry, you can really see that it's a dying industry and it's not a favorable investment. <laughs> Maybe follow on that. Uh, some big companies they they may divest uh, on the on that industry just for advertisements for say making the company looks good. Just like the, all the oil companies, they say, oh, we build environmental uh, whatever to, to help clean air. But if you 
Pasco, the oil company, they all have those programs and they, they, they put advertisement out. And uh, uh, so, do you have uh, some, I just wonder, I, I want something concrete to, to stop that, to make them bad or, yeah. Spank them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, governments and churches and schools and all the up to Mike Lee's, the layman's uh, question. Yeah, you just don't yeah, want sorry. You don't want no. governments and schools and like Northwestern. I'm glad you're going to go after Northwestern. It, it says oil, coal, cars, planes, everywhere on that campus. It's the yeah. most conservative yeah. oil based school in the, and you'll have a tough time getting in there because they're private. They're not going to give you any information. We're not in charge of that movement. There's a group of students that are taking the lead Great. on that movement. Awesome. So, so my question is, <laughs> at the beginning of your presentation you said something about 350. I missed the, my hearing. The, at the very beginning, the uh, level of parts per million or whatever that is, 350, you said uh, in history, do you remember that sentence? Can yeah. you say that again for it us was, people? Never. Yeah, so <laughs> by taking ice core samples like out of glaciers and there's little pieces, there's little air bubbles in there, they can test the parts per million of carbon up to a million years back and same right. with spring, lake sediment and tree rings. So they can see how much carbon was in the atmosphere back to a million years ago and it does fluctuate with temperature, but the max, like the threshold that it ever reached was 296 parts per million. Oh, back a million years, and now we're at 400. So that statement just shows that it's man-made climate change, and that as carbon dioxide increases, temperature increases, because they follow each other. So that statement just shows that this is man-made climate change. It's not natural fluctuations of the Earth. What do you call that, anthropologic? Yes. Anthropogenic. Anthropogenic. And the Anders. Because yeah. okay. I know there's natural ups and downs and right. things that suck up CO2 and things that release CO2, but then there's the addition of anthro or whatever. And those take thousands of years to happen. We have reversed, so there's been, we've been on a 5,000 year cooling trend according to Science Magazine. We've reversed 2,000 years of cooling in 100 years. So it's clearly the earth doesn't move that fast. Andy? I, uh, are you, uh, for the last 30 years or so, Rocky Mountain Institute has been teaching big businesses, you know, how to invest in the least cost energy strategy. And I wonder, their, their book was published called Winning the Oil Endgame in 2004. It's still a classic. And I wondered if you, if you guys were availing yourself of that resource, which is one of the best in the world, to teach businesses to go for profit in clean energy and get off of fossil fuel. You know, they're, they're one of the best resources in the world. Uh, somebody asked here, uh, is, uh, are resources available to get off of oil? Yes, uh, solar and wind are competitive with oil right now and 100 mile per gallon cars are ready to go anytime we overrule <coughs> the billionaire predators that are keeping those things out of the American market. Okay? With current oil uh, prices? What? With current oil prices? Yes. Uh, uh, solar and wind power are currently uh, uh, competitive with current oil and fossil fuel prices right now. It's not in the future, it's happening now. Yeah, solar has decreased 99% in cost. But um, we'll have to get that resource from you because we are not looking into that right now. Um, we do have someone on our team who is a financial <coughs> advisor. It would help um, you greatly. Yeah, so yeah. he probably is familiar with that resource. Okay, Bob Rosenfield. Oh, yeah. Give me some of that. I just want to ask, um, you know, more of a, of a personal nature. What got you involved with 350 and was there like uh, some kind of life event or just something that, that you did to... Just curious about how you got involved and a little bit about your own personal stories yeah, and how you yeah. got involved. <laughs> Essentially, yes. So I just graduated from college about a year and like four months ago now. Okay. 
and I wasn't really involved a lot in school. And then once I graduated and came to Chicago, um, I did. A, I was doing a lot more reading for fun, and I read Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, and I read a lot of Noam Chomsky, and he talks about similar things. So I just wanted to get involved with an organization in Chicago, and that's when I found the listing for Three Chicago. I reached out to Melissa. We met for coffee, and it's a year and a half later, and I'm standing in store now. What college was it reading? Um, I went to the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and I have a history and communication double major. Cool. And yes. So I also went to University of Illinois. I have a bachelor's in chemistry and a master's in natural resources and environmental science. And so in just learning all of this, I just, like, from the depths of my soul, have a passion to solve the climate crisis. Like, I just feel totally called to do it, um, and I think God's leading me that way, so that's my <laughs> calling. Um, and so also I wanted, my friend Julio is also very passionate, and he had told me about 350.org, and we wanted to start taking action, because um, I feel one way to really alleviate the despair is to take action and fight for the way of life that you want to live. And so um, we wanted to join 350, and we saw there was not one in Chicago, so we launched it. Um, so as Dana mentioned before, I have no experience in community organizing, um, so this is all very new for me, um, but I'm really enjoying it. And that is, um, at your universities, uh, have, is there a huge movement at the universities yeah to act on climate change. It seems to me that the, the college, there's a lot of really active college, but there's also a lot of ones that are not paying attention. So speaking from personal experience, at the University of Illinois, there's not a lot of activity going on for acting on climate change or a lot of other political movements for that matter. I think a lot of the universities who get really into it are very liberal universities and they've always been exposed to an activist nature. But I also think that they have professors that are, are pushing them forward and leading them in the right direction. And I think that's so important. And a lot of these universities do have those professors who have been, have been active in these certain movements since the 60s. So. Yeah, I just want to add to that too. I don't feel it's very student driven, but I do know there are professors who care to do about climate change that are moving things forward. And they have um, the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center is on Illinois' campus, and so they are trying to move into you know, sustainable energy. Uh, Catherine Pensack, and then yes. Bob Rosenstein. Yes, um, thank you. I was looking at the part that said yeah, all about point? feeling really depressed and what can you do and so forth. You guys think. And this is a great movement to try to get um, us to divest, you know, but we need to look very locally, too, because even though our government hasn't done certain things like the Kyoto Agreement and so forth, what you do locally can be done and can be done very, actually, easily. Even your alderman has a lot of options in their, you know, and, um, for example, they can, they have a, a small business improvement fund that allows them to give money to small businesses like this restaurant to put solar panels on at 75% off of the cost. So what I'm saying is there are things that you can do local. But the small businesses have, don't know about it, right? But your so. alderman needs to, you need to push your alderman to push this program to go to the businesses when this money comes available, because it comes available at varying times. Um, and then, of course, the city can do more. And I just wanted to mention um, the Solutions Project. Have you heard of that? It's from Stanford University, and they have a plan for 100% renewable, not nuclear, just wind, solar, and you know, um, by 2050. And it would be pretty per expensive, state. but it's by state. And you can go online to the Solutions Project and look at your state. And it has a plan for how you can become 100% renewable by, by 2050. So once you have that information, you can take that to your alderman or your mayor and and say, we need to do this and this and this, you know. And you're right, it's becoming very cost effective. And don't forget one thing that I think you know but just didn't happen to mention is the other costs of oil. Beside, you know, that things like wind and solar don't have the side effects that cause these diseases and things that we're paying for. The hidden cost besides just the subsidies. Twenty percent of our military goes to the oil. Bingo. Yeah. So bingo. Yeah. Good, so point. Go local. Good things to bring up. Yeah. Good. Thanks for putting that up. Yeah. Um.
You mentioned 60 countries are involved in that. And I, met, I think you mentioned about China. Could you tell me a little bit what's happening in China as far as the climate change movement is concerned and what the government is doing there? <laughs> So they are investing a lot in solar energy. I learned more about this. So I went through Al Gore's climate leader training. Um, so he talked a lot about what China is doing. And they're outpacing the U.S. in terms of wind and solar. And they're beating their records of what they wanted to invest in. So I know they are investing in renewable energy. But they are also still using a lot of coal. Um, and that's why the people are uprising. You probably heard in Beijing about all of the pollution. Um, so hopefully the people can start to push their governments. I don't know how well that's going to work. Um, but that's about the extent of what I know. No more Yeah. Dave Zucker. Yes. Recently there was an announcement on the news that the BP plant at Whiting is shutting down for a while. The yeah, price of oil. Yeah, it's going to go up. So <coughs> what are we to make of this? Is BP telling the truth, or is this some dodge that they're pulling to raise the price of oil? <laughs> I haven't even thought of that, but I know that they have problems shutting down in the past, so I don't know what's going on at the plant. But that's an excellent point, just to show <coughs> that fossil fuel industry is very fluctu it fluctuates it's a lot. A it's not, yeah, it's not a, a it's a risky business. I wouldn't trust it, anything. It is a scam. Like a, they they proved yeah, in yeah. California that they've done this over and over again, where they shut uh, down the refineries. Laura, for you're, you're yeah. interrupting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just. There proving. are other people who have a question too, Laura. Uh, <laughs> just throwing out some truth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> isn't, isn't it rather facetious? Isn't it rather facetious to say that we're not really interested in destroying the fossil fuel industry or at least having to transform? To renewable energy, because as you mentioned yourself in your presentation, no matter who burns it, it's still going to increase the CO2 content of the atmosphere. So, should we start a conversation on how we can help these large corporations, which are responsible for a lot of our greenhouse gas emissions, divest themselves and transform to renewable energy on a much larger scale than we can expect to be done on a local basis? It has to be a global thing to have be able to maintain yeah. the climate resiliency. So what is 350.org doing in this particular sense? Making the divestment fee for the large corporations in the fossil fuel industry, which should be one of our long-term goals as well. I don't know how much 350 National is working to help transform the fossil fossil fuel industries from fossil fuels to help them with renewables. I think more of their plan, I was at a convergence with a lot of the local leaders from around the country, and 350, or environmentalists don't necessarily want fossil fuel companies to take over renewable energies. A lot of people want community involvement in their energy, and they want to own their local energy. Like, we don't, it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to have a big corporation owning all your energy. Your community can own the energy that's in your community, and that's more sustainable for the people that live there. Well, it's, it's transforming these corporations to make them more responsive to local interests. We're going to have to be. And I think that fossil fuel companies, once they see that their product is on the out, they will be forced to transform themselves because they'll go where the money is. Yeah, they just don't have any will to do that right now. There's no incentive for them right now to change their business model. Because they, no. they just don't care about climate change, it seems. So. We have to initiate that conversation to make them real, yeah, to make the people realize that they, these companies have to transform. Uh, Pat Butler? Yeah, uh, it's obviously, fortunately or unfortunately, we all share the same planet, and we share it with uh, some countries which are not exactly run by nice guys. China is one of them, the Soviet, Russia is another. India has not exactly been in the forefront of anti-pollution uh, measures. How do we get those countries uh, to see the practical advantage, and there are practical advantages, to switching to uh, renewable, uh, replaceable uh, fossil, uh, non-fossil fuels? We're talking to people who don't listen to their own people. Why would they listen to the rest of the world? I'll take the first. Um, so countries like China and India, one of their main arguments, a lot of developing countries, their main argument is that the United States, England, Great Britain, like we've been burning 
oil and fossil fuels for so long that like we got to be developed and now we're trying to tell them that they can't do exactly what we did before them. But if the United States took the lead and said, okay, this is where, I, this is where people need to be in 2050, other countries would follow suit. But if the United States isn't putting a plan forward to cut back their own emissions, then why should other countries have to cut back theirs? I think that's how like India and China, even Russia are looking at the situation now. And I think there's, just to add to that, there's also like the risk for the United States if other countries do get there before us. You know, I think it's really disastrous for our country and our economy if India and China leapfrog into renewable energy and leave us behind. So I think it's to our benefit, too, to be leaders in renewable energy. All right, Dennis Nelson. I understand that, like, um, you folks have got to uh, pick your battles with the volunteer staff and limited resources. I certainly support also <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this investment. I'm going to be discussing the Illinois uh, Clean Power Plan during the rebuttal. Do you have any uh, perspectives, any views about that? Um, I know Tony Fuller, you probably know him from the Sierra Club, has um, given me data, like information on that. I haven't had a chance to read through it yet, um, so I'm actually not as familiar with it as I should be. Um, but I do plan to look into that. It's not good enough. Uh, okay. No, it's not good enough? Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> we'll get back. Yeah. Oh, yes. I do plan to look into that. Charlie Sato. Charlie? Yeah, you spoke earlier about three candidates for President of the United States who are pro-carbon. I was wondering, have they been bought off by the, by the industry? Yeah. Yes. Or do oh, yeah, they before. feel that that's where the votes are? And well, they are willing to take off. the money because they know their votes are there. Do you think, do you think we're losing the, the public opinion? Uh, They've definitely been paid off, but the reason that the votes are there is because money, mo the money is sinking. You, I mean, I'm sure you've all seen the commercials that are made for by Coke Industries or Americans for, for Prosperity. People, if you're not looking into it, all you're receiving is this oil propaganda. Okay. And so they might, like Ted Cruz down in Texas, yeah, he probably thinks that that's where the votes are because people are getting wrong information. If they were getting the truth, then maybe the votes wouldn't be there. Yeah, and there are polls that show the majority of Americans care about climate change and think we need to be doing something. So I don't know how they reconcile that with their voting. That, two levels, one follow-up question. Yeah, are you concerned about Global warming, yes. Are you concerned about gas for your Chevrolet? Right. Wouldn't it be nice to not have to worry about putting gas in your Chevrolet? Yay! Yay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Laura, we got a question. Um, no, I'll do it in the rebuttal. Okay. Oh, I just wanted to add um, one thing that we can say to right-wingers is with, um, with clean energy, like say solar, small solar groups, like community groups and so forth, it's not as easy to be taken over or to be, um, you know, attacked or, you know, it's a safer, actually, um, type of energy. You know? Right now they could really target our main power stations. <laughs> and close down all or large part of the city. But when you divest, divest the energy throughout the city, they can't take it all down at once. It's more inherently resilient, in other words. Definitely. I've read a lot of a lot of different books um, about talking about how terrorist attacks, like we are so, like we're so prone to it because it's, we're so easily accessible right. through our oil systems, our pipelines, our nuclear plants. Or accident. Yeah, yeah. accident, yeah, accident. Um, we better start thinking about getting into rebuttals. Uh, yes. Uh, it's, we we want to allow How many uh, more have questions? I'm sorry, I'm rebuttal. No. All right. Uh, I, I do just have one quick one. Did you see Minnesota? 350.org is yes. the one that's having, it's Minnesota, not yes. Madison. Okay. And, and Detroit. Uh, Andy Pierce How many have questions? Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to get you there. Hang on, Bob. Comments to make for the rest of us. Let her finish, Bob. I would like to see how many rebuttals we have. One, two, 
three, four. It's not uh, not all of them are revoked. Five. <laughs> Some of them are additional information. It's the only way to talk without this guy yelling at you. <laughs> all right. All right. Real quick, if anybody. Okay, just a second. If anybody wants a website up during their rebuttal, you just let me know and I'll flash up a direct data or whatever you need to help augment it tonight. I, it's the first thing I'm going to try to do. So, you know, if you have a... a Arctic methane science group. What is it? Arctic methane science group. We have 10 okay. ready to uh, go. All right. Uh, Here, let me point this out. Where's that back? Okay. Do we have five minutes each? If you go, yeah. If you go, to, the, if you go to the website every week, right here in the upper right-hand corner, tells you the upcoming program. So it's very easy. If you go up a little bit... Be sure to join one of these groups. Okay, so what was it? What was it, uh, Dr. Laura? What was it? Matt? Yeah, it was an Arctic Arctic Science Methane Group. Okay. We sort of lined up. Over All right. There. All right. Let's thank our speakers. Yay. 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 All right. Give me a second to get up. So uh, the speakers were excellent. Thank you so much, Chicago350.org. That was excellent. And um, this is, people do not understand, it's not, it's happening now. So, uh, climate change is happening now. The seven states are on fire to the point where they don't, they've run out of resources and they're bringing in Canadian planes and, and uh, you know, emergency personnel from uh, outside of the America. America. We are absolutely in the throes of climate change already. James Hansen came out recently and said that we are on track for a 10 feet uh, level sea level rise by 2050. And that means that Boston is gone. New York City is gone. Miami is gone. New Orleans, gone. Seattle, gone. San Diego, gone. Let's just add up the cost of that, shall we? <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's beyond ridiculous. So it really is. We, it's, it's not about how we're going to save money for our cars. It's how we're going to save our lives, how we're going to save our food supply. So I would really recommend that everybody pay very serious attention to this. It is the, um, is it, yeah. it is the issue for the survival of humanity and all life on this planet right now. We're, they're talking about we are in the throes of the sixth mass extinction. We're losing species faster than they did in the Permian mass extinction. Um, there's a great 10-minute um, video called lasthours.org, lasthours.org, and it talks about one of the tipping points that might happen as we get, uh, as we are warm the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic Ocean is the key here, and we have. Uh, you know, I don't even know how much. I haven't seen the number for the total amount of methane that is in frozen slurry at the base of the Arctic Ocean. And if we uh, raise the temperature of the Arctic Ocean high enough, and they don't know that temperature, they don't know what that is, it's all unknown, then it will start releasing in mass the methane, and it'll be over for us. It'll be over. It's, uh, it'll be very similar to the Permian mass extinction. You should absolutely read the book, The Sixth Mass Extinction. It came out, won a Pulitzer Prize. So this is really, really serious. So to the young ladies, I want to tell you, I want to just suggest, we are not going to get there with just community solar and community projects. We're go we are going to have to do what Bob said, which is pressure the companies to use their massive wealth to make the transition as well. We'll take over their energy supplies later, but first we just got to get the carbon, you know, stop the carbon, right? And there are, there are some bright spots. Uh, they just came out with a new technology where um, they're, it's, it's carbon nanofibers. Carbon nanofibers are really, really important for buildings and for planes and things like that. And they developed a process where they can suck carbon out of the air to build carbon nanofibers. It's one of the first um, 
you know, marketable ideas where we'll actually be able to draw carbon from the atmosphere and uh, besides the ocean and the trees and everything where man can draw carbon from the atmosphere we're going to be able to, we're going to have to do that it's not actually just stopping fossil fuels that we need we need to draw carbon from the atmosphere so we are this is really tense i don't i i don't know about you people but i can barely sleep at night we are absolutely on the cliff. I have read credible scientists that say that if we do not start the downward trend in three years, it's, we're, it's over. So please, join these ladies. Join uh, Frack Free Illinois. Join Chicago. Any of the groups that are fighting the fossil fuel industry. We would really appreciate it, and so would humanity. Bye-bye. OK. Okay, Dennis, any, any website you want up? The NEIS one? <laughs> okay. Hey, my name is uh, Dennis Nelson, and thank you, Melissa and Dana, for an excellent presentation. This past Tuesday, August 18th, I signed a petition to our world leaders from uh, national350.org. We need a climate deal that's in line with the imperatives of science and justice. Keep at least 80% of fossil fuels in the ground and finance a just transition to 100% renewable energy by 2050. The purpose is to generate climate action for the upcoming uh, Global Climate Summit in Paris during December. Now I'm going to switch to the Illinois uh, Clean Power Plan. I'm the Vice President of the Chicago-based Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS, Illinois Nuclear Power Watchdog Group. Our website is www.neis.org. On Monday, May 14th of this year, I submitted these comments on the website to uh, Illinois Governor Bruce Rauner. First off, just say yes to a non-fossil fuel, non-nuclear state clean power plan for Illinois, the land of Lincoln, to implement efficiency, cogeneration, and renewables. Using its authority under the Clean Air Act in June 2014, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. EPA, issued draft rules under its Clean Power Plan for all the states to cut their carbon pollution from fossil fuel power plants and factories. Being finalized and going into effect later this year, the Clean Power Plan will require the states to reduce their carbon pollution about 30% by 2030 from a 2005 baseline. Quote, in an early March op-ed in his hometown Lexington Herald leader, Ill Kentucky Senator Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, called on states to refuse to participate in clean power plan rulemaking. Think twice before submitting a state plan, McConnell wrote. A few weeks later, McConnell doubled down on opposition to the new federal rules and wrote a letter to the National Governors Association in which he called on all 50 governors to carefully review the consequences before signing up for this deeply misguided plan. From Jason Mark, The Green Energy Revolt, The Progressive, Volume 79, Number 5, May 2015, pages 20 to 23. Quite simply, I dismiss uh, Senator Mitch McConnell's call for state-level civil disobedience as merely political theater. The US EPA's Clean Power Plan includes eminently reasonable targets. In fact, I maintain that they should be even more ambitious in order to meet the scale and magnitude of our climate crisis, and it gives the states a great deal of flexibility in how they must comply. According to environmental journalist Jason Mark, quote, more to the point, McConnell's politics of coal state resentment are becoming obsolete because of the steady advances in renewable energy technologies, unquote. In fact, nationally, the solar and wind industries were booming. Quote, in 2014, solar net generation grew 103%, while wind grew 8%. Since 2008, wind and solar energy capacity in the United States has tripled, unquote. On Wednesday, April 29, 2015, at a reception at the Sierra Club office in Chicago, nuclear engineer Arnie Gunderson, now turned efficiency and renewable advocate of Fairwinds Energy Education, FEE, stated that wind turbines generate electricity at under four cents a kilowatt hour. A recent dynamite report by the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center at North 
Carolina State University concluded that a fully financed 5 kilowatt solar photovoltaic system costs less than the grid electricity purchased from a residential customer's local utility in 42 of the 50 largest U.S. cities. Chicago ranks number 28, somewhere in the middle of the pack or the middle of the heap, depending on how you look at it. Also in 46 of those 50 biggest U.S. cities, solar is a better investment than the stock market. Continuing on, under no circumstances should the state clean power plan for Illinois, the land of Lincoln, be misused to prop up a necessary, costly, and inherently polluting nuclear power. The year 1954 was when the chair of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, USAEC, said at a meeting in Chicago, the nuclear power would be too cheap to meter. Now let us fast forward to the present. Flunking the test of the energy marketplace miserably, the heavily taxpayer and ratepayer subsidized nuclear power failure, my little play on words, has become too bleak to matter. The giant nuclear utility Exelon wants the Illinois General Assembly in Springfield to bail out five of its financially troubled nuclear reactors with our ratepayers' dollars. These five economically failing nuclear culprits are Quad Cities 1 and 2, Byron 1 and 2, and Clinton 1. How much will this proposed Exelon corporate nuclear bailout cost all of us Illinois ratepayers? To the tune of an initial $560 million this year, with the whopping total of $1.5 billion over five years. Secondly, just say no to the huge Exelon corporate nuclear bailout. Just say no to Exelon, our corporate nuclear welfare queen and king. Exelon deserves the double title of nuclear welfare queen and king. Thanks a lot. Okay. Sit going. Um, fossil fuels are not just for uh, cars or energy and things that have nature. There's something far more uh, sinister about fossil fuels. Let me uh, give you a little history. The United States invaded through itself or through its surrogates, a hundred different countries in the 20th century. Right now, it's on the border of uh, Russia. Why? Because Russia has a lot of fossil fuels. It's in Libya. It's all over the Middle East. The United States has a hundred, some 80 bases around the world. Now, all that is not just for the sake of fossil fuels. It's for the sake of dominating the world. And we're the latest country to dominate the world or try to dominate it. So if it gets control of all the fossil fuels in the world, it dominates the world. Because everything runs on energy, runs on fossil fuels. And that's one of the biggest reasons why it doesn't want to divest in fossil fuels. The only thing that could bring us out of that, I think, is a different social and economic system. And as long as we have the system that we have now, and based on capitalism and imperialism, it's going to keep doing that. So what, what do we need? We need a mass movement, not only in fossil fuel uh, divestment and things of that nature, which I think is very important, but other things, a disinvestment in, in uh, armaments. The United States produces 41% of all armaments in the world. And when people bring up other countries that are worse than ours, I can't think of one, not even one. We commit a genocide against the uh, Indians. We commit a genocide against the blacks. The United States has a very sorry history, a very sorry history, and a lot of people in, have, have been duped into believing that we're the greatest democracy that ever happened on this earth, which is nonsense. And I think the only way we're going to get rid of this, and uh, um, Naomi Klein brought this out in the, about that the latest book of hers about change, is that the capitalist system has to go before we could do anything real.
Uh, the Native Americans have an ethos that everything we do should first be decided by the question, how does our action impact uh, the lives of seven generations after ours? So it's in that ethos, I think uh, we, in a country that is 5% of the global population, approximately 330 to 340 million people out of 7 billion, should really take into account uh, we're not, we're not in a position to point the finger at India or China or Russia. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, do we want to collapse from within like Rome did? Or do we want to have a moment that is unprecedented where it's a first mass solidarity that we are a small number of people who are a member of in a larger global family? Or do we want to have a six mass extinction? Is there a word for which the definition is an amount of money that is so high, even if all people on earth combine their total value of all our wealth into one number, it would still not be possible to raise that amount of money? So this, I pose this always, and I suggest everyone here, pose this to the free market uh, proponents of how to solve this challenge. Say, whatever that word is, extinction costs that number. Uh, the ozone layer repair technology that we've all been heard about, the Rockefellers developed and a lot of other free market capitalists developed that's uh, in the warehouse somewhere that they didn't break out yet. Uh, our patients said it's an end for them to reveal that to the public so we can start to save the only biosphere we have. So, you know, we're happy to find one issue in history where everybody agrees we all, no matter where we are or where we're from, hate extinction. <laughs> so that's a good thing. That's the positive. No one on earth is going to say they want extinction. So I think we found something that we can have a first mass solidarity. Uh, please bear in mind that it's great to suggest things. It's great to support politicians. It's great to have referendums and such. But we are dealing in I can say this from experience. I do feel like I'm kind of in the know because my father worked at Fermilab here in Illinois and at CERN in Switzerland and Daisy in Germany. Uh, we're dealing with a cartel, the real cartel, the oil cartel. Uh, they're an endgame strategy right now because their business model has failed, their moral model has failed, and any other model that they could ever claim to have has failed, and everybody on the planet knows it. Uh, in Copenhagen, they had a chance. In Kyoto, they had a chance. Ever since the first Earth Day, they had their chances. And our patience of we the people of planet Earth is at an end. We've decided that we love our planet that much. We love our families and our communities that much. We want a future for our children and our grandchildren that much. That their time is over. It's nothing personal against them. It is a principled stance. They would do the same thing if they hadn't forfeited their souls. So uh, we're very happy to hear any suggestion about Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Anything in Any Book by Noam Chomsky, because those are the two people, if you read them, you no longer feel despair. You feel like, we can do this. And that is awesome that you mentioned those two <laughs> authors. So the first mass solidarity, not the sixth mass extinction, Let's do it. We're America. We can do anything we put our hearts to. Hey, uh, Lee Ping, any website? Okay. All right, when you're ready. Thank you for the speakers and uh, energetic and uh, uh, full of energy. Uh, I just uh, like to uh, don't be too serious. Uh, I heard that uh, the New York, uh, uh, Boston. Boston, all those big cities are will be underwater, and uh, so let everybody come to Chicago, and uh, our house price will be up, and everybody becomes a millionaire. Uh, Thank you. Okay, that's a joking. Okay. Uh, one thing I, I just like to say, uh, 
It's, uh, it's nice to have this uh, public movement uh, to let people know uh, fossil fuel is, is uh, hurting us. It's uh, very bad. Uh, but uh, it's more more strong force. I think it's uh, we want to uh, encourage uh, build up the carbon tax because right now, uh, in, at least in the uh, uh, economy, it's uh, it's, uh, it's 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 there. Uh, people will buy whatever is cheaper. If it uh, the oil is cheaper, they buy the oil. If uh, wind power and the other method of energy is cheaper, they will go for that. I don't see that. Uh, big movement now, but uh, uh, so fossil fuel, I think it's, uh, it's not going away uh, soon. But we want to eliminate that just like a cigarette. Okay, we put uh, lots of tax on the cigarette and uh, then uh, uh, price gets higher and higher and uh, with uh, the, the trend of the culture and uh, then eventually people will uh, much reduced using uh, fossil fuel. I think that's uh, that's uh, probably the best way to kill that. Uh, not really kill it, uh, sub substantially uh, reduce the carbon uh, use, carbon dioxide in the in the air, uh, or carbon tax or green tax. <laughs> One thing is uh, uh, that gentleman brought up. Uh, the carbon tax will raise the price of the uh, uh, essential gasoline used uh, for the poor people. And uh, then uh, we probably just need uh, to use the carbon tax money to build a strong uh, social network welfare system. And, uh, and we can redistribute even if we put lots of carbon tax on the, on the fossil fuel. Then we can reduce uh, personal tax, income tax, or property tax, or sales tax. I think uh, with uh, uh, those approach, uh, it should be, uh, that's one way to, I, I would prefer. Another is uh, for solar and wind technology, I'm a technology person. Uh, I think uh, solar technology, I've heard it's uh, cheap enough, but uh, another problem is uh, we, those technology needs uh, lots of battery power to store the energy because uh, that energy is not always there. And uh, right now we don't have uh, much uh, battery okay. power to store uh, that. And also those two technology, wind and the solar, uh, requires lots of land, okay, massive of land. Uh, that's uh, maybe the material of the solar panel, it's uh, low enough, but uh, you may not have the land prices uh, still uh, pricey, okay. So that's my, some my comments. The oil is not going away very soon, but uh, next week I'll try to provide some general information about oil. I uh, hope you can join us. Thank you. Okay. Go to Google. Google, you said? <laughs> Chicago, what is it called? New York Dash. Yeah, you should go back up. We only use three New York Dash. Dash. You really shouldn't. All right. <laughs> hang on, hang on. He's wanting to get a website up. All right. Um, it's a Facebook. All right. Um, I, I don't like when we talk about energy or fossil fuels because they're all different. And they have all different extraction methods. And they have all different uses. And they have all different problems and issues. <laughs> It's coming up. One it's coming up. Not the first one. How'd <laughs> you get the first rating on Google? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, so anyway. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, natural gas is the least problematic because it. Uh, get that one off of there. <laughs> you want the other one? Yeah, the other one, the Facebook one. That's mine. That's his. Anyway, 
So natural gas is the re, uh, creates the least amount of um, again natural gas is for well, hot water for some plants for generating electricity and it's also for heat and cooking but it's the least problematic uh, and we have a domestic supply coal we have a huge domestic supply we don't rely we don't go to war for oil or for coal we have a thousand year supply of coal in this country yet yeah, it's bad for um, air pollution and um, climate change and uh, but there are substitutes in the economic world there are substitutes available the biggest problem is oil that fossil fuel so they're all different there's natural gas there's coal and there's oil we go to war for oil we go to war with oil um, we spend 20% of our military budget every year, which is hundreds of billions of dollars, defending um, oil tankers coming from the Middle East. We do not export oil to any country. We burn all oil domestically that we produce domestically. We import oil from other countries. Oil is also something, besides going to war for oil and going to war with oil, oh, by the way, half of our military that was killed in Iraq were killed on oil convoys by IUDs while they were transporting oil and IUDs. gasoline. IUDs. IUDs. <laughs> okay, so anyway, you get the general idea. So, um, half of the um, half of the deaths in Iraq were from transporting gasoline and jet fuel. So, and here's the kicker about oil: besides war and pollution, air pollution, and everything else, oil is 90 percent, 70, 80 percent, 90 percent used for transportation: cars, buses, trains, planes, all that. But guess what? There is no substitute for oil and jet fuel and gasoline and diesel. There's no substitute for it. There's not going to be any switchgrass. There's not going to be ethanol economically made. Nothing. You cannot run a plane or a train on thorium or nuclear plants or electricity. Well, you can't on electricity. So oil is going to be around. Yes. I mean, it, it, the cars are huge, are ex very expensive that are all electric. So the only way we get off of oil is one way. I wish Charlie was still here. Uh, we have to have better transportation systems, by far. Europe, with similar GN GDPs as us, uses half the oil per capita as we do. Because what do they have? They have, of course, bullet trains, like we just showed. And they have superior transportation systems. But we have, a, apparently, a governor now in Illinois that doesn't want to fund transportation. See how nuts that is? So anyway, my, uh, my sol to solve the oil crisis, the oil problem, uh, oil wars, everything else is we got to start taxing oil and gasoline and jet fuel properly. And uh, that's about all you have to say. Support the New York Chicago public okay. train. All right. Okay, next. Good job. No, okay, go ahead. I'm just going to make some miscellaneous comments, mostly focused on the energy crisis. And the M after you, okay? First of all, I want to thank Tim for you for the fine work he's done putting these uh, videos up online. For those of us who can always make these meetings, it's a, he, he certainly has my respect for that. Uh, I have a lot of adopted sisters now. I just adopted our two speakers. I adopted Laura. I've adopted Naomi Klein. I've adopted <laughs> Professor Rachel Hyberlock at University of Illinois with her freshwater lab and her concern about uh, water conservation in the Middle East and Great Lakes region. And Deborah Shaw, our water reclamation commissioner. So they're all great and they're all working for these goals. You know, the one thing I'm really uh, concerned about is that. I, I think these community-oriented projects are great. I support them a thousand percent. 
But I do believe, as Rabbi Michael Leder, the uh, editor of Tikkun, wrote, they are not sufficient, really. We've gone f far beyond the stage of climate instability where we can expect <coughs> just local efforts to work. We have to have a global conversation on con converting from fossil fuels to uh, carbon neutral renewable energy with the caveat that these carbon does have a useful place, the new technology that was mentioned. We have uh, uh, graphene, which can have uh, very important impacts in uh, converting so, uh, solar energy to electricity. But uh, we really cannot uh, expect to uh, maintain the climate resiliency by just having local initiatives. We've gone far beyond that level. One other thing I noticed, someone mentioned the ozone depletion. Uh, the work on ozone depletion, which won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for uh, Professor Rowland, who's now deceased in my met, and uh, Professor Molino at uh, MIT. And uh, industry has adapted uh, new types of materials to uh, not have to deal with the chlorofluorocarbons, which result in a lot of ozone depletion. So DuPont does make money on materials which hope, which don't deplete the ozone layer and are, still have some problems there with the uh, impact as greenhouse gases. But there, it, there is a chance, and I, that's why I think it's important to maintain a dialogue with industry to help them transform. I think the carbon tax, which is mentioned, will be one tool in that transformation process. So I think we really have to have these kind. That's why I go to meetings of the American Chemical Society, even though it's dominated by uh, private industry interests in the chemical industry. We have to talk to the people in the industry about the need to transform. And I, I do my best. I don't claim that I've had any major impact, but I just feel a moral obligation to use whatever knowledge of chemistry and physics I have to bring up these issues of alternative ways of developing an economy. But I think with the wind, solar, geothermal, hydrogen, and uh, I would also say controlled nuclear fusion, not fission, is a long-term research effort we have to engage in. One other thing I've uh, noticed that we can't, we can't really rely on coal even though it's cheap. That's a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, and we have to keep the natural gas in the ground because the EPA itself uh, uh, labels uh, natural gas, mostly methane, is a hundred times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. And according to the researches of Professor Antonio Grafia from the Department of Civil Engineering and Environmental Engineering at Cornell, all our fracking <coughs> sites and all our sites for extracting natural gas release anywhere from 2 to 10 percent of the uh, methane uh, is released. Uh, well, you can argue which is a more potent greenhouse gas, methane or CO2, but Professor David Archer at the uh, University of Chicago has pointed out that over an eight-year time period, most of the methane is oxidized into CO2. So uh, I share Laura's deep concern about the permafrost uh, meltdowns, not just in the Arctic, but in Alaska and Siberia as well. And uh, that will certainly uh, result in a tremendous efflux of uh, methane, which will eventually be converted into CO2. So, so you, you have your choice. And the other thing, though, uh, I want to close out with, I was at that talk that Bill McKibben gave at Northwestern, and I was deeply concerned of the pessimism time. that, that uh, McKibben showed about the uh, possibility of retaining climate resiliency. He says with the meltdown of the uh, Antarctic ice caps, that it's irreversible. He'll go down fighting. We have a long way to go, and we have little time to do it. Okay, Andy, when you're ready. Okay, when you set, and I'll start. Okay. Yes. Okay, I'm going to. Yeah, go ahead. First of all, I'd like to thank our two young speakers I want to go away for, uh, for doing a tremendous presentation here tonight. And, uh, one asked, you know, there's a comment I ran across in, in one of these books. It might have been this one. I, I'm not sure. It said, you know, anybody that's raised in a moral and ethical uh, background 
when you understand the problem and you understand there's something you can do about it, you naturally feel compelled to get involved. It's, it's human nature with people that are raised with a conscience. And uh, one of the problems we have in American society is that we're dealing with, okay, look around me, uh, nobody probably has ever has told you this before, but look at the people here. We're all part of what history will record as the greatest generation in history. Not the World War II people that won World War II, but us living now we will be either, we'll go down in history as the people that rose to the challenge and solved the greatest crisis of humanity ever faced, or we will go down in history as the people that sat on overwhelming information and produced the greatest failure in the history of the human race. We're the greatest generation, one way or the other, and we, you only have to work for a few more years. You don't have to do this for your whole life. Within five to ten years, we're going to know if it's irreversible and the sea level is coming up 60 feet. We'll know that in less than a decade. Okay. Um, there's enough money and wealth uh, to solve all the problems we've been talking about. Uh, that money is currently being hoarded in the bank accounts of a few hundred billionaire predators on the globe. We're running the greatest welfare for billionaire predators the human race has ever seen since the pharaohs walked the earth. So it's just proposing economic solutions is not going to quite deal with the problem until we start using proper language and say these people are billionaire predator killers and we have to figure out some way to deal with them. We, tell, we teach seventh graders in order to solve any problem you must first correctly identify the problem and then correctly identify the solution. The solutions, let's talk about solutions. We're hip deep in solutions. Harvey Wasserman published a book called Solartopia in 2007, looking back from the year 2030. If we just went with what was economically feasible in 2007 and converted our economy, by 2030, 23 years, we'd be running America on a hydrogen economy, hydrogen powered planes, <coughs> hydrogen powered cars, trains, no coal, no oil, no gas, and no nukes. Somebody, maybe one of you in the audience can tell me where this quote came from. Uh, I, it's in one of the books. Amory quoted it. It is better to work toward a world that is, seems too good to be true rather than drift toward a world that is too dreadful to contemplate. That's where we are. Let's work toward uh, a, a world that uh, seems too good to be true. A lot of things that were thought to be science fiction 50 years ago have come to, come to be true. We have smoke-free restaurants now. <laughs> it's easier for everybody to breathe. We yeah. still have a few addicts that have to go outside and have a <laughs> suck fest, <laughs> suck on a weed for three minutes. That's what it is. It's a suck fest. <laughs> suck on as much nicotine as you can in two or three minutes. <laughs> but at least Naomi we don't. Klein nailed it when she said this changes everything. We need a new economic <laughs> system. Uh, the, the current system of profit-driven capitalism is not going to solve this problem. Okay. Uh, Professor Griffin's book, uh, I tell people out of the hundreds, you know, several thousand books I translated into one page cliff notes in the last 40 years, this one is among my top five. I don't know what the other four are yet, but this book, unprecedented, about can civilization survive the CO2 crisis, is right up there in the top five. He, it just summarizes everything. He makes the point that we are way past the point where we can phase into a gradual solution. We need a World War II type mobilization where the country mobilizes for a few years and produces wind, solar, everything needed to be done. And as I said, uh, Smedley Butler wrote this book in 1935. It's been reprinted in 2013. War is a racket. Every young person should have a copy of this book and pass it on to other people to understand that we have to take the money, the trillion dollars a year that's being wasted on the military around the world, and use that in America to solve these kinds of problems. One of our seventh graders produced a, uh, you talk about solutions. There's houses without furnaces in Chalmers need for $10 a month. The car companies have been sitting on 100 mile per gallon prototypes since 1980. They can mass produce 100 mile per gallon cars or better anytime the decision is made to do so. And those cars can be run on bottled hydrogen. So there's uh, all kinds of solutions if we have the strength and the courage to go for it.
So be cordial. Thank you for your time. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm going to go next real quick. All right. I'm going to go next. Many of you, um, many of you already know about my strong support for a simple equation called E equals M C squared. Energy equals the mass times the speed of light squared. Yes, Dennis, I'm going to talk about nuclear power. And I am going to confirm the fact that today's present day light water reactors are not the way to do nuclear. Thank you. As a matter of fact, Alvin Weinberg, one of the co-inventors along with Admiral Rickover, back in 1973, stated that this is not the best way to do civilian nuclear power. Well, it's not a matter of wanting to shut down the old technology. It's a matter of innovating to use it properly. And we did run a reactor in the 1960s called the Molten Salt Reactor for well over 60,000 hours at Oak Ridge. Dennis, I know you're going to yeah, you're going to come out and go against it, but I know what I'm talking about because I have checked the sources. There were several retired guys who worked on this reactor. Although it didn't run with thorium at the time, there has been several reactors that have been, which is what India is doing right now. Over 300 people in China are working on right now, and these reactors are don't have the high pressure. They don't have the inherent problems with meltdown because you have to keep a, a uranium-233. Uh, anyway, if you look at the technical details by going to the Thorium Energy Alliance or Googling nuclear power, you'll find that they are inherently safe. For example, a plant about the size of this room could probably power the entire north side of the city of Chicago with about a basketball size of nuclear waste coming out of it. Now for me, when I look at climate change and I look at getting off oil, this to me is the only way that's really going to make sense. Not that renewables aren't going to be a part of the mix, not that solar's not going to be part of the mix, but they're just not going to provide enough power. We do not want to have climate change because people will want to industrialize. They will want to change. And the more we have cheap energy, the better we get civilization off for everyone, and the more conservation efforts we can do if people are happy, healthy, and prosperous. <coughs> I came to this about four years ago myself when I started looking into this issue of climate change and energy, and I've been involved, actively interested since the 1970s. And frankly, I did not see a solution, especially when, uh, when you look at our wonderful internet, that even your smartphones in the aggregate, if they run, per, per, if you look at all the energy taken cons conservatively in just a small smartphone itself, when you consider the data centers, the uh, aggregation of fiber optic cable and all the energy, it uses as much power as a refrigerator. Each home now has six, maybe eight of them if it's a typical family. So we're not going to get over this, uh, you know, do it with just renewables alone. Germany has gotten into a renewable economy, and their and their renewables. They're they're talking about the high energy costs in Germany as of today, right now, and they have been trying it. I wish Germany would succeed with the renewable source. I'm on my way to the renewable energy fair tomorrow to learn more about renewables and see what they can do, but. As of right now, I am fully and utterly convinced that the only real way we're going to be off climate change is with a, is just to innovate in the nuclear field, perfect something called the thorium molten salt reactor, and at that point also deploy it worldwide. The thing is, we make these. My neighborhood. Well, Charlie, it'll be in the middle of an industrial park. It ain't going to matter to you as a resident at all. Now, with the hydrogen economy and every other innovation coming in, yes, we can solve our climate pro problem. But don't discount nuclear because the dinosaur reactors are running right now. And if you really look at it, I think you'll agree. Thank you. I wouldn't mind the next yeah. one, Charlie. Yeah. To anyone who thinks, yeah. anyone who thinks that concern over climate change 
or concern over renewable forms of energy is something that is for the starry-eyed dreamers to think about, take another thought. It's now a matter of survival. Uh, there is no question. Just, just, <coughs> just look at the weather. We're all old enough to know what the typical winter weather and what the typical summer weather was like 15, 20 years ago. We don't have to go back much further than that. You will notice a sea change of differences. When we keep hearing of the polar ice caps melting, when we keep hearing of polar bears being caught on smaller and smaller ice caps and starving to death, this should in itself be a sign that we need to do something and do something quickly. But it isn't just the scientists and the people on the college campuses and places like the College of Complexes. Three weeks ago, Pope Francis, who is a most unusual pope, uttered some of the same warnings that we heard tonight. Now, before you say, oh yeah, he's a pope, he's a churchman, what does he know? i got to point out that the man before he became a priest had a number of careers, including a longshoreman and bouncer. So he was not your typical pope. And if I were a member of the College of Cardinals, I would not want to argue with a guy who spent several years throwing rowdies out of nightclubs in Buenos Aires. Uh, he's a guy that you will listen to one way or another. September 24th. But we have, we have another issue here. Most of us here would love to see the Allies pull out of the Middle East yesterday. Most of us would agree that there's no reason we should be there except to protect our interests and to go after the bad guys. All right, having said that, as long as we are dependent on the Middle East for oil, we are not an independent country. We are, in effect, an economic colony of people who, as I said earlier, are not very nice guys. If you want independence, if you want to be able to free yourself from these kinds of involvements, and remember, our first president, George Washington, in his final speech to Congress, warned against entangling foreign alliances. The most strangulating foreign alliances we have had in recent years have been in the Middle East. Over what? The holy places? No. Oil. Oil and oil again. You want to be free from that? We have to find a substitute for that. It is entirely possible that we can do this if we, as one previous speaker, I believe it was Andy, suggested, we go on a World War II type of footing. We devote all of our attentions to finding new forms of energy which will do the job, do it cheaply, and do it right here at home so that we are not dependent on other countries who frankly, ladies and gentlemen, cannot be trusted to have our back. That's for sure. We have got to think in these terms. We have got to get tough about it for ourselves for our posterity, indeed for the whole world. You want to have world peace, eliminate what is right now one of the biggest causes of discord in the world today. Oil. Now, I realize that, that you know, 25 years from now, uh, our children or our grandchildren are going to be sitting in a place like this talking about what do we do about the water shortage because that is going to be the next thing we're going to be fighting over. But we don't have to worry about that today. Today all we got to worry about is finding another source of renewable energy. It's out there. As I said, two years ago I was at a demonstration of this hybrid car which is just a baby step in the right direction. But it had a lot of people who were very interested. It had a lot of possibilities. These are the kinds of things that we need to be exploring. 
unless you want to uh, unless you want to be fighting the next war over the same old stupid issues and unless you want to be worried about bombs going off in the United States and other places we're going to have to find a solution it's there use a little imagination in 1943 the president of the United States called in some of the best scientists in the country and said gentlemen I want you to find what is necessary to build a super bomb, the atomic bomb. Now, however we feel about the atomic bomb, you'll notice that it was done and it was done on deadline. Let's put that same kind of determination, that same kind of organization, let the President of the United States call in some of the eminent scientists, some of the eminent thinkers, and say, gentlemen, I give you three years I want you to find a renewable form of energy that is cheap, that is accessible, and that is not going to create problems down the road. It can be done, folks. Use more than a little imagination, use a little determination, and we'll see it happen. Thank you. Okay, next. Uh, next. Yes, it worked before. It was. All right, David Zucker. And the same initiative was also used 50 years ago when we put men on the moon for the first time. Well, right. He didn't go there. And secondly, <laughs> the Pope is also, I noticed, uh, it's, I'm, I'm also noticed that the Pope is coming here this fall. And I, for one, wouldn't want to be a member of Congress and buck the Pope. <laughs> and he's going to address a joint session of Congress. <laughs> and you can bet that John Boehner, who's a Catholic, and some of the other people are not happy to have him there. Well, that's just too bad. Um, I have said, talked about my own criticism of nuclear power before. Most of you heard what I have to say, but it bears perhaps just a little repeating. When I was in high school, 45 years ago, Commonwealth Edison had built its new plant, or was building its new plant in Zion. And they were promising us decades and decades of cheap electricity. And they even had that little cartoon character that was on the commercials, Little Bill, oh, yes. <laughs> uh, who told us that we would all be living better electrically. Well, that bill ain't so little now, folks. And, um, Zion is closed and it's in the process of being decommissioned. So I'm a little skeptical about nuclear power. If you can do it the way that Admiral Rickover brought it to the Navy, where he made it plain that it was going to come either with the maximum possible safety standards or it wasn't going to come to the Navy at all, fine. But the nuclear industry has been very lax over the, over the past 50 years or so. And so I question that as a source of renewable and as a source of, of, as a way to help us out with global warming. Um, third, as many of you have noticed, the fossil fuel industry has wormed itself, wormed itself in practically everywhere. Many of us in this room watch Nova on public television as I do. And if you look through the list of their sponsors at the beginning of the program, why, one of them is the David H. Koch Charitable Foundation. <laughs> Now, I don't know whether that slants the program or doesn't. I hope it doesn't. I still plan to watch it. But still, I'm a little bit suspicious of anything that Mr. Koch and his brother are busy doing. Uh, next of all, back around the turn of the century, when the, when the robber barons of that era were in power and were giving money, to, as the Rockefellers did to the University of Chicago, I'm told that there was one such debate about whether a school should accept some of the money that these people are handing out. And people called out at one meeting, this was tainted money and the school shouldn't take it. At which point, one of the other people in the room said, bring on your tainted money. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, last but not least, they ask us to trust them. Particularly, as one particular oil company did, you know, every, every commercial they showed on television when I was a boy in the 50s and 60s. Thank you very much. The end of that commercial always was, you can trust your car to the men who wear the star, mm. the big, bright Texaco okay. star. Ah, ah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, yay! Thank you, David. All right, Jerry, you, right. you can sneak in after I do. All right.
what? I'll be eclectic because you don't want you can sneak in behind after me. Okay. All right, let's thank our speakers again. I'll be eclectic as usual. A very nice PowerPoint presentation. I would have made it a little juicier. I wanted some propaganda, anti-oil company stuff, you know. But maybe you can put that in there, you know, how, how nefarious they are, you know. Uh, jumping around. Oh yeah, I forgot to announce. If you want to get involved in politics, it's a good year. Um, there'll be a meeting on Wednesday. The Independent Voters of Illinois on Wednesday at 6:30. If you want to come to state board meeting. Are you drafting Joe Biden for president? You know, actually, yeah. I'm running the entire legislative department, federal, state, and local level. Mainly because they can't fill those vacancies. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, it's rather disheartening to learn that uh, following legislation, as I try to do, that we only managed to get three out of the 144 pieces of legislation through Congress that were pro-environment. By the way, it's a good idea, apart from the divestment thing, keeping the issue of global warming alive is the real thing you're doing and achieving. Whether or not the divestment works or not, whether other investment investors show up, isn't it? We're not going to put conceivably these industries out of business uh, totally, but uh, make it in life and comfortable for them. Um, but keeping the issue of global warming alive is the primary mission goal, I think, of your agency. It's disheartening. We only got three out of 144. It's not surprising. Kyoto Treaty has never been passed. Some of the things you're up against, um, yeah, there's a lot of, and you know, I was amazed, there's a lot of infrastructure in the United States. Carl was just here, he just left. You go down to Indiana and you try to say divest out of the oil industry, you're not going to get much of an audience. I, I went to Oklahoma about a year or so ago uh, um, on a trip, and it's amazing, I went to Cushing where all the pipelines come together. The, the infrastructure that's of the United States, the very economy that's inherent to the oil, uh, coal, and gas industries. And they are not going to be a welcome audience to anything that ecological people have to say. I, I, I don't think they're going to hear this. Um, another thing that kind of bothers me, I, I like to follow agriculture where there, there really is a high energy usage. Uh, the production of our food. I'm going to the state fair in here, but we've never been able to seemingly reduce the usage in that regard. Uh, one of the things I think you ought to focus on, uh, it's easy to give advice to other organizations, is, is an election year, as I said, uh, is to try to make some effort to influence the campaigns in some fashion. I'd highly recommend that. We've got to make the environment and this global warming the issue. It is slowly and conceivably going to be disregarded. Um, when these guys openly flaunt uh, the issue, and as I heard today, one campaigner just saying this is a wonderful period of time that we have so much oil to burn. Fossil fuel, isn't it wonderful? Burn <laughs> yeah. me. Yes. Uh, one of the things we did in the transportation industry, and I just did this the other day, we contacted all of the campaigns, and I mean all of them, even them are kind of on the fringe, uh, advocating a high-speed rail and trying to make public transit the issue, trying to ascertain where their cam campaigns were. It can be done. It's a little hard to find out how to contact the campaign, but it can be done. Uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, anybody, if I hear this again, that this car that can go 100 miles per hour is wonderful for us, yeah. please, I'm not going to feel very well. Don't you realize the energy that goes into manufacturing an automobile? Do you think it drops out of the sky? Do you think metal comes just comes preformed? Do you think we're living, we, I enjoy living in an asphalt nation? This is ridiculous. To say, oh, this is another one of these craziest half solutions. By the way, you said that things, uh, I was talking about agriculture, and you're saying, oh, you can't store energy. And farms, 50, 100 years ago, every little farm had a little motor, and they would run it during the day, store their energy, and they use that for the milking machines and to light their houses at night. It's not new technology. You can store the energy, and they did it for decades. 
They did it during the war, even, uh, in rural areas. We have to make this oil thing expensive to them on the campaign. They got about 50% of the votes here, whether we like it or not. Um, let's see, the other thing I was thinking of, we were talking about oil prices here, and you probably know way a lot more than I do about this, but I believe gasoline actually was more expensive years ago than it is today. The price, though it may be 3 to $4, is significantly cheaper than it was decades ago. I'm almost certain of that. Inflation, yeah. All right. It is it is infinitely cheaper than it was in the 20s and 30s. Okay. You know, uh, one other thing that came to mind, and you're talking about the the other thing that amazed me here, and I was thinking about this a few years ago. There was a thing like these tar sands was considered some impossible thing that no one would ever do in their right mind, and it amazes me that it's in operation today. So what's going on here? That was there's a thing like you only talk about petroleum at the pump, and that was petroleum in the ground is like hypothetical things like this. And last of all, regarding this thorium reactor stuff, which I please keep them out of my neighborhood, but a thorium reactor right now can be whatever you want because it doesn't exist. Hey. You can make up this. And you can make up that, and it does this, and it does that. Because why? Because it doesn't exist. Charlie, there was just a big investor <laughs> yeah, on Wall Street. It's <laughs> ten years away. This is like like fiction. You know what fiction is? I'm a librarian. We've got nonfiction, and we have fiction. Take a look at the IPO <laughs> offerings out in Charlie. Yeah, whatever exists, it's just in your mind. Anyhow, no. thanks a lot. Come again, and yeah, okay. that was pretty cool. Our speakers get the last word. Okay, Dr. Wallace, sorry about that. Rebuttal, rebuttal. We get two rebuttals. So just, oh, we got two of them here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 We just uh, want to correct some miscorrection, uh, mis uh, misstatements that were sent out there. Um, okay, the carbon tax, the carbon tax and dividend. I, I for one, believe that, uh, of course, uh, it's our personal usage. I even our, the way we eat, okay, because uh, actually the largest source of carbon out there is our agriculture system. So moving to a vegetarian diet is an absolutely a very important um, environmental move right now. So the, we, we have to divest, we have to end the subsidies, we have to uh, you know, move to renewable energy, we have to do them all. So the carbon tax is actually the way they talk about it the most with the citizens' climate lobby. It's a carbon tax and dividend. So they'll, it'll be um, it'll be uh, put on the car on the uh, fossil fuel companies at the point of production, and it'll be uh, returned to the uh, taxpayers via their tax returns and um, for investment in you know renewable energy, uh, electric cars. Maybe even mass transit. You'll have to lobby for that, Charles. That mass transit, uh, you know, uh, the amount of money that we spend on mass transit will be part of that return to us. So it's a carbon tax and dividend. It's really important because yes, we do understand that uh, lower income people are going to be hit hard in this transition, and we want to make that easier for them. So this is the way they've designed to do that. Okay. Um, number two, uh, the. Um, it is oil, it is natural gas, it is coal, it is all the carbon. Um, natural gas, right now, uh, Professor Grafia actually had talks about the methane release being so big that um, on the frack fields that it's actually two times dirtier than coal yeah. for, the, for the climate. So it is oil, it is uh, natural gas, it is coal, it is methane, it is uh, our agricultural system, it is all of it. Um, it's, it, it actually is the biggest source of carbon out there is our agricultural system. It's the oil uh, fertilizers and all of the oil petroleum based um, pesticides okay. that we put in. Uh, and one of the, um, there was a gentleman that came out uh, recently with a mushroom based fertilizer and, <laughs> and pesticide, Paul Stamets. He's a brilliant man. I'm sure he's going to uh, bring it on. He's going to bring it on. Okay. Yay, fungus. Okay, so uh, the land needed for renewable energy, it actually is much smaller than uh, we think because 
the uh, next generation of these, um, the wind turbines for sure are coming out. They're called rotational uh, wind turbines. They're, it's like a, a very, very highly flexible pole and it'll be uh, it'll create energy by just kind of going around in a circle like this. There won't be the big turbines and it'll need a lot less energy or a lot less land and it'll need a lot less wind. So they're becoming much more efficient, just like the solar panels are becoming much more efficient. Um, the carbon, uh, the batteries, the batteries, there are carbon-based batteries. This is what I was talking about, the nanotechnology, you guys, that's coming out now. There's carbon-based uh, batteries for storage. There's also um, uh, uh, batteries that they're developing with no rear earth elements. So all of that is in the pipeline, like coming out now. All this stuff is going to be, you'll see it in the next two years, coming into the marketplace. And um, the, uh, the replacement for oil is algae oil, because we are going to need oil for certain things. There are some things. And so al um, creating, algae, creating oil from algae is a, is a carbon neutral uh, technology, and that's coming out as well. And uh, we are at the, uh, forget thorium, that's way too expensive. No. And um, we are at no. uh, off the wall, off the wall no. expensive, um, and dangerous. No. So then it, we could get so much renewable energy for that amount, for the amount of money that we would pay for it. Pay for it. So we are at a Black Lives Matter moment, politically, uh, everyone. We okay. need a Black Lives Matter moment for uh, for the uh, climate change, for the climate crisis. And so I'll see you at the uh, presidential campaigns. Please make it quick. I'm going to limit now everybody about two minutes, okay? Yeah, I'm probably only in 30 seconds. I always go on. I've never gone over. Uh, to my knowledge, there wasn't any election when we, the public, had an opportunity to vote yes or no for the 2003 Iraq War. So I just wanted to correct that. I heard one speaker, I don't know whether the thought process was that we go to war, as in we the people. Um, so I just want to just uh, go a little bit deeper into that concept. Uh, and the future wars for water will be waged exactly the same way if we the people fail to organize against that. So uh, we, we don't go to war for oil. Uh, we the people, the overwhelming majority of United Statesians, if that's even a, a concept, uh, we're absolutely opposed to the Iraq War of 2003 uh, which is still now happening. We all thought that it ended. It's still going on, uh, contrary to the corporate media. Any poll taken proves uh, our opposition to the Iraq War. So a small cartel of extraordinary wealthy, powerful, influential overseers, financiers, oligarchs, business CEOs, corrupt politicians, private mercenary contractors, and corporate media propagandists uh, stole, abused, and wasted our time, our trust, and our treasure to go to the Iraq War. So if there was a vote okay. cast, uh, we did vote against it. So please be careful right. when you're talking to folks. Uh, just like the phrase, it's our system, I don't ever remember getting an opportunity to vote on our at system, this time, whatever that is. So, at this time, we're going to have again, to... Once again, thank you, 350.org, solidarity with 350.org. Okay. I think, Dennis, you, want, you got like... Oh. All right, let's, 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 yeah, let's, okay, no, yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, we're out of time. So, um, sorry, we have to get going, so we're just going to say thank you so much, everyone, for welcoming, welcoming us here today. It was great to be with all of you and to hear all of your ideas. Um, I find it really invigorating that there are so many people who are passionate about this issue, um, so I feel warmed to be here. Um, and it sounds like we all are in agreement, pretty much. We're fighting for the same thing. We want to preserve our planet. Um, we know fossil fuels are not sustainable. Um, there are so many solutions out there, and so we just need to get our political people in motion. We need a mobilization. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you. I also feel like it's really invigorating to be up here in front of all of you, and I, I agree with Mr. We just need a popular movement. Everyone just needs to kind of come uh, together and fight. Where's the mic? It's it's on, but it's it might be it takes a nine volt battery and it drains about in three hours. Also, people were talking about books a lot today. I think if you have never read *A People's History* by Howard Zinn, you should be reading *A People's History*.
Let's thank our speakers again.